Hello, welcome to Active Bright Systems, and this podcast is all about strength and conditioning. And we've got my good friend here, the living legend. Good to be here. What's your <laughs> max deadlift? Max deadlift ever was 240 at 83 kilos. At 83 kilos? 83 what was kilos. that again? What was the weight? Eight. Oh, the weight. Yeah. 240, baby. 240 <laughs> at 85 kilo. Can you fucking believe that? <laughs> this is the real, real deal. And how old are you? I am 20. No, I'm 32. He does fucking trying to say he's fucking 20 <laughs> when he's 32. <laughs> it's absolutely brilliant. So, uh, so Michael, you know, we've known each other about a year, two years. Three coming so up. Three? Three. Fucking hell, it's gone quick, isn't it? <laughs> so I've known Michael for three years and he studied with the Czech Institute. He started doing exercise coach. Then he asked for my advice, should he do any more? And I said no, because look at all the books that I've read. And Michael's got a great book, but it's down there, <laughs> yeah. uh, which is all about strength and conditioning. Do you really need to do hundreds of courses? No. It's all about your your love and your passion for what you do for you to get great success for your clients. It's not the certificate on the wall. So don't be in your ego. So what I said to Michael, first of all, when he'd done his first course, now spend, how much you spent on books? Quite a lot, actually. How much is quite a lot? I would say... Be Pacific, because the audience want to know. I would say about 500, maybe a grand on books. So you spent a grand on books, and how much has that enhanced your business? A lot. And it's enhanced my knowledge. Not only that, it's enhanced my training methods. Because when I read my books as well, I practice on myself first before I take it to the clients, right? Because remember this as well, when you read something, you must practice it. But not only that, if something doesn't work for you, doesn't mean it might not work for them. So always keep that in mind. Everybody is an individual when they do their training. Does that make sense? I hope it does to you guys out there. <laughs> yeah, it's really important to never put your client in a in a cookie cutter approach. It's really got to be an individualized approach. And when you do an individualized approach, you will have phenomenal success with your clients and your client base will grow much quicker. Now, how I trained my surgeon to how I trained my doctor, uh, not my doctor, my surgeon to my golfer <clears throat> is totally different. Is that the same for you, Michael, with your clients? It is. One of my basketball players, Dan, so the important thing for him is using box jumps for power training. But again, when we look at what his sport requires him to do, there's a lot of jumping, there's squatting, there's a lot of passing. Even though there's a lot of pressing because of the passing of the ball, we focus on the back because we don't want our clients to look like this. Yes. This is bad posture. It's going to make them worse at their sport. We want more upright posture as well. Not only that, we must look at the muscles that are phasic as well. Yes. I.e. the hamstring, the glutes. What does phasic mean for the audience, for the new people? So for phasic, let's put it in a nice simple way, right? So it, instead of chasing the rabbit, right, you might throw a stone at it. That's like a lot of twisted motion, yes. basically. Yes, yes. These are muscles that make us explosive. Yes. Now, Coach Dan John says this, for tonic muscles, right, a simple way of remembering that, if a tiger was tracing you up the tree, right, and you were mm. hanging, yes. you want your pec mine, <laughs> pec mage to be yes. really tight so you can hang there for long. Yes. But if you want to throw a spear, for instance, to catch mm. that rabbit, you want your rhomboids, middle, low, trapezium, more explosive. I hope that that makes sense to you guys. But what now. do you think about these guys that are getting their clients to do box jumps at the end of their workout? What do you think about that? And what do you think about, you know, is it important to assess the client before you get them to do any of this box stump work of course and what you what what in your opinion needs to be assessed well first and foremost you need to assess the range of motion of the client for instance in their lower back to see if they've got tight hip flexors tight yeah. quads hamstring yeah. core strength is another thing as well yes and you must also ask the client as well what injuries do you have there's no point of giving somebody box joints if they got bad knees, for instance. Yeah, so what exercise would you give to somebody that was looking for enhanced in their in their jumping capacity, yeah. but they had an injury? How would you uh, get around that? Or would you say to them, look, you can't do box jumps until you're completely out of pain? That would be one thing, but you would mimic the movement of jumping. So i.e. jumping is squat. Yes, and it is a bend pattern as well. If you look at when people jump in a box jump, 
they don't always squat down, but they mimic like a bend pattern. Yes. But the movement of a jump is still a squat. So you will use basic movement patterns of squatting and bending, mm. deadlifting, squatting. Again, the other thing I've noticed with people as well, they keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. And that can cause a repetitive injury, couldn't it? Of course. And no recovery. I.e., if you keep doing back squat, your back squat might improve, right? You must change within six to six, six to eight weeks. I.e., when my clients do back squats, I make them go to front squat. Or Zercher squat. What's a Zercher squat? I've not heard of that. So the Zercher squat, for instance, the barbell sits in the crook of the elbow like this. Again, oh, I've seen that. Right? But I wonder what it was. Yeah, okay. Yeah. With the, if somebody's having problems getting into this position in the front squat, you can either use the wrist straps to hold it like that. Right? Yes. That's easier. It will still mimic the front squat. Yeah, it sounds excellent. Anterior loading, which is front loading of the spine, basically. The good thing about the Zercher and the front squat as well, it keeps you upright. Which yes. is important as well. Yes. And because it engages your core more as well. Yes. And your abdominals. The other good thing about the front and the Zercher squat as well, it's great for people that feel like they're bending their hips too much and the bar might dump out, right? So it's yeah. safer in that way. You can dump the bar quicker compared yeah. to the back squat. The back right. squat, if you get caught underneath it. And you must make sure you're right in the cage, right next to the hooks. Yeah. Not standing fucking five mile away yep. thinking that, you know, if you're coming up to your one rep max or your one exercise, you know, fatiguing and you can't get there in time. I've seen this many times mm. where guys that do back squat and they're not standing in the rack properly. It's just absolutely madness. The other madness thing as well, I would say if people do bot squatting, for instance... Oh, and they're sitting on their sacroiliac joint, joint and they're coccyx. Yeah. If you're gonna get, if you're gonna do the box squat, make sure you keep your form into it and not rock into it. Especially, don't crash. I see, I have to tell. I knew I knew box squat to teach beginners, right? But I want to get away from the box because it becomes a crutch. Does that make sense? Yeah, but the other thing you've got mm. to think about mm. is that you've got the coccyx you're just mm. at the bottom of the spine. Yeah. And as that person sits down, the mm. hip rotates under, under and then they're sitting on their coccyx. So yeah. If they crash on the coccyx, yeah. that is a really painful mm. injury that you can get. So I would never use that yeah. ever. I would rather use a Swiss ball, mm. put the ball behind you, yep. and then go down to parallel for a three to six mm. weeks, and then go lower than parallel. Mm. Remember, you need to be able to sit on a toilet. So yeah. if you're in China, or if you was in uh, Thailand, the, the toilets are on the floor. Yep. They're not like the Western toilets that we have in the UK, yeah. where you're sitting on the toilet and you go to 90 degrees. Mm -hmm. You go lower than 90 degrees. So it's really important that you go all the way down in the squat, yeah. all the way up. So if you've got a box squat, mm -hmm. you're really never going fully. Yeah. So you're making them muscles short and tight, tight because you're not doing full range of movement. But there is another way. Instead of using the box, you can use the pins as well on the power cage. To engage the depth as well, so that could be an alternative to the box. Yeah, part. yeah, I agree with that. Well, mm. what do you think of the uh, uh, the disabled uh, power rack, as in the the Smith machine? The Smith machine. I fucking hate it. But if you've got an injury mm -hmm. or you've got an injured client, it's a really good tool to have. Yeah. But what I see fundamentally, especially you women out there. You'll do it all the fucking time. Yeah. And then you try and use a free weight bar and you've got no fucking chance yeah. of doing a decent squat because when you're using the Smith machine, mm -hmm. it's stabilizing everything. You're not using your own body. Yeah. So really, I think Smith machines should be out of the gyms. They should only be in specialized gyms for people with you know, special needs as in you know, they've got an injury or a problem and then build them up and then get them to free squat and yeah. stuff like that. Would you agree? I would agree with that, especially like you said about the um, Swiss ball. If somebody couldn't do a normal squat or they struggled with depth, for instance, that's the best thing to use is the Swiss ball because it's easy. And again, if somebody's in pain, for instance, make them go down before they're in pain and work to a range of motion there and then build them up. Make sure also they're engaged in the core breathing in properly the other thing with the swiss ball squat as well when people start to master it you can give them dumbbells in their hands of course you can yeah or you can make them hold it like this which will mimic a goblet squat so what does a gob goblet squat do so a goblet squat the good thing about the goblet squat so when you come down 
in the squat, you can put your hands here in your knees. Where some people... So you're still only doing half the movement? Yeah. But imagine... Sorry, I have to just demonstrate. So, for instance, some people, when they squat, they do like this. They push their knees in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you go there, you can use that to teach the idea to push out. Yes. With the elbow, okay. basically. Okay, okay. Again... That's a good exercise, then. It's a good exercise. It's a good way to engage the client. Well, you see it with females, especially, where they want to collapse inwards with their knees when they squat sometimes. Yeah, but when they're collapsing inwardly, it's showing that their glute med is yes, too and weak. Glute, and glute and, and their uh, inner thighs. Yeah, the inner thighs and, yeah, inner and adductors. Yeah. So you really need to strengthen the glute med, the glute max, as well as the mm. inner adductors. Yeah. Them adductor machines should be thrown out of the gyms because you see women and even mm. fucking guys yeah. doing it to death. They're making their adductors really strong, yeah. but not working the whole of the muscle, muscle of the leg. They're isolating that one muscle, yeah. which will get short and tight. And then if they're running, sprinting, or something, they've got a chance of blowing it out, g- getting a big injury. The other thing, when we used to talk about the adductor and inductor, if we were going to get rid of them, right, which I highly agree with, yeah, bands could do the exact same thing. But Checky mm. believes that bands don't really cross over into the body. Yeah. Because they're not rigid enough. Yeah, which is true. So I don't really agree with bands. Like, yeah. I know a lot of physios, yeah. if you've injured your shoulder, they'll give you a band exercise mm-hmm. to do. But really, but I suppose it's all relevant. If you're a yeah. builder and you're having to pick up a, a, a brick, mm-hmm. a band really won't cross over into the no. shoulder, will it? No. The other thing I... What I've noticed with bands as well, right? They give you so, for instance, they start light at the bottom, for instance, like here. Yeah. But they're stretching it heavier at the top. Yes. So it's like what they call in these deep textbooks, they call it the strength curve, basically. So okay. It'd be different points of where you get stronger. I.e., if you look at when you bicep curl, most people are stuck here. Yes. About that. But when they get here, it's easy. Yes. That's that's the benefit of the bands. It can work that strength curve. So really, really important is that I see this time and time again. I can't believe I've been in the industry for 20 years and there's still fucking idiots just doing the wrong thing in the gym as in they're doing really short bicep curls. No, not they're the not doing range. full range of movement. They're not doing full range of movement in the uh, deadlift or full range of movement in the squat. Yeah. Now, when it comes to bench pressing, yeah. if you're not doing full range, it's okay because it's healthier for your shoulders. Yeah. But if you're not doing full range for your squat and you're a footballer, then this is where you, or a rugby player, mm. this is where you're setting yourself up for an in- injury. Yeah. So we've been on the... Uh, channel now for 12 minutes so we've got another couple of minutes to, to talk uh, michael so yeah, of course. what what would you say is the biggest thing you want people to take away honestly when it comes when it comes to training and for beginners for beginners honestly i would tell beginners don't be afraid to get a personal trainer and look for a good one Really and what would what would you say is a good uh, personal trainer this man here for, <laughs> for a start right Thank you. Go right. on. And yourself. Go on. A good personal trainer, right, is always up to date with his knowledge. And is always willing to try things that make sense, even though he might not agree with it, right? But he will try it to see if it works for the client. At the end of the day, we're individuals. We're all different, yeah, right? We all that. need to be trained differently. I train differently from Scott. Mm. So, for for instance, one of my clients is like me, right? If he does uh, what we would do, like a max rep at a certain weight, right? He can only do one set of it, and that's it. He won't he won't be able to hit the target again. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. But one of my other clients, right? He can get away with the volume, but before he burns out, we we'll change it back to intensity. Yes. That I can't. I remember Charles Poliquin talking about this as well. I think the Russians talked about it as well, i.e. Yeah. some people will, can go balls to wall with intensity. Yeah. Others can't. Some people can get away with more volume. Yes. And others will need mixing the two up. So what you've got to remember, really, all you coaches, trainers, you know, out there, is that everyone is unique as their eyeball or their fingerprint. So you can't give everybody 15 reps or... 12 repetitions or eight repetitions for hypertrophy training. Yep. Okay. I've seen clients 
or Pacific client I've got at the moment, I can give him 15 to 20 reps for three sets and he gets stronger. He gets bigger. So if I did take him down, which he doesn't want that, he doesn't want to go down to one to six, yeah. he would get even bigger and I would get fired. Yeah. So it's re- really, <coughs> so it's really important <laughs> that you, that you, you know, individualize everything you do. Yeah. Not one of us look the same, so we don't have the same diet. This is why metabolic typing works, simply because there's either a protein type, a carb type, or a mixed type. You're either one of them, or you might be all of them together. But without being tested, you don't know. And this is what's fundamental about the check system or the pool check system is that we don't treat everybody the same. Everybody is an individual. Everybody gets an individualized program. So then we get success in your exercise workout or program. And I agree with Michael that, you know, if you really want to get success in the gym, even if you're an elite person that's been training for years, find a good trainer. So I've been in the industry for 20 years. How long have you been on it for? Coming up to four years now. Four years. I want to make But how long have you been training yourself? Ten years. I Ten just years. Want to make a so that means he's a master. <laughs> Excuse me, Scott. 10,000 hours. <laughs> Can I make uh, one point as well? Yeah, I go think on. it's very good for personal trainers. Always have feedback as well. Hey, Arnold. Always ask the clients for feedback. How they're feeling? How did you find that set? Do you again? This comes from Russian training that I I like a lot. I do the Czech stuff, but I read up Russian. I read up a lot of different types of training. Yeah, it's important. Right? I agree. Right, you must get your feedback from your clients because again, when it comes to recovery, right, mm. you don't know if you're frying a client too much. Are they overtrained, undertrained, right, or not fucking trained at all? At all, or deconditioned? Yes. So you must ask the client as well how you're feeling from the exercise. So you might have to change all no, the time. Yeah, but you need to ask how the client's feeling as soon as you see them. Mm. As soon as you shake their hand and say, good morning, mm. or how are you today? Mm. I always say, how are you feeling today? How is, how's your day been? Oh, Scott, yeah. it's been an absolute fucking nightmare day. I'm really pissed off. I want to train hard. Yeah. And I'll train them lighter. Yeah. Because I know that the stress level that they're going to get from training hard will fry devalue them. and fry them from getting the result that they're looking for. Of course. And Arnold agrees. <laughs> Go on, carry on. But yeah, you must always ask feedback from every exercise you do as well. Your clients should be happy, right? But it, but look at their face. And I said, like this man said here, I ask how they always are at the beginning of the session as well. Right, because you need to know. And it's not, hey, you guys out there, it's not about beasting your client. No. So I see a, a trainer at the, the engine room gym that I use in Great Portland Street, and the trainer was going, one more, one more, another one, one more. And the client was shaking, and the client couldn't comprehend what he should be doing, and the form had completely gone. Yep. So it's really, really important, the form principle. As soon as your client's form goes, even if it's 15 minutes into the workout, stop. Because they will thank you for that. <laughs> Arnold's jumping around. He's getting the ump that I've got him, that I've got him in my hands. <laughs> so it's really, really important that you look at this. That you, If your client is paying you 50, 60, 70, 200 pounds an hour, you want to be on them like a fucking radar. You don't want to be looking at your, your watch. You don't want to be looking at your phone. You don't want to be scratching your bollocks. You don't want to be scratching your hair that I ain't got. You know, it's really, really important that you are there for your client. Yeah. I've got a client that's been with me for 18 years. I've got another five clients that have been with me for five years. And that's because when I'm at work, I'm at work. I'm not there to... Uh, faff around and be a pussy I'm there to make sure that my pussy clients <laughs> turn into man clients <laughs> right to, to say one thing and then we'll shut the video off off you go well, 90 minutes now <laughs> I don't know what to say but one thing I will say right as well he doesn't know what to say I'll be back <laughs> at least he could say that couldn't he yeah, could do. add variation to your program that's a big thing. And have a fucking program. I'm going around the gym like I've just come back from training today before I met Michael. And 90.9% of the guys and girls no program. The other thing I would say as well, where we say about no program, I've seen 
uh, people having journals, which is a very good thing to have to write down what reps. Yeah, I agree that. with that. Yeah, you've got to write down your rep sets, loads, and tempos Tempo. if you know what it fucking means. Mm. If you don't know what it means, then you need to either book Michael, which you can get a link to his Instagram below, or you come and see me, yeah. and I will do a four hour assessment of your body, of your diet, your lifestyle, and your movement patterns. That's another thing that's really important. Yeah. Before you're training your client, Find out what their body's capable of doing. Don't just put them straight into the beast program because they want to lose 10 pounds in 10 days. It ain't going to fucking happen. The other good point that you made there as well is what I would say is go up to a personal trainer and ask for a program. Ask them to write you one even if you yeah. get charged for it. Yeah. I always... Remember out there, if you're going to pay £50 for a program and you come and see me and my program's £150... You know the difference. Yeah. If you buy a, like I've got a Tag Heuer watch on. Now, if you buy a Tag Heuer watch to a Seiko watch, the Seiko watch is going to cost you £12. It's going to last as long, but it isn't going to have quality. It's not going to look as good, <coughs> and you're not going to be able to sell it back for the same money. So this is the same thing with program design. You're only going to get a good program design with somebody with good knowledge like Michael or myself. So really... In my opinion, getting a great trainer is a minimum of 10 years of experience. Yeah. You know, of workout experience. So Michael's been working out for 10 years, so he's been putting it into his body and practicing it. And this is really important. If I'm going to work with another trainer and the trainer says, I've only been training for three weeks, fuck off, I'm not working with you. You know what I mean? I want to work with somebody that really knows their meat and potatoes so then that way I don't get injured on their program. I also want to make a point as well for beginner trainers as well. Don't be afraid to meet somebody like this man here or myself to help you guys out with knowledge as well. Of course, we have to charge because we have to make a living, right? Yes. But we love our job and we want to see you successful. Yes. This man has taught me a lot, right? And I've taught him a lot as well. Yes. So never, ever be afraid to ask. So when I'm in the gym, if somebody comes up to me and they go, Oh, Scott, uh, I know you're a trainer, but uh, I'm really <sighs> interested in knowing about this exercise. I don't go, fuck off, you twat. I say to them, look, let me finish my workout and we'll have a chat afterwards. We'll go and get a coffee. Yeah. That's how friendly and open I am. But if they want me to write them a program, then that's when their checkbook or their credit card has to come out. Because at the end of the day, you know, Michael said he spent £500 on books. Then he spent another three, 4000 educating himself. Exactly. Then he's got 10 years of experience. Yeah. Do you really expect him to give his knowledge away for free? No. And one more other thing I'll say, because it's 22 minutes now. I hope you've watched the video and enjoyed it. It's really important. And subscribe. Please <laughs> fucking subscribe. Otherwise, I'm going to come round and wash your windows. No, I'm not joking. <laughs> so it's, it's really, really important to understand you get what you pay for if this is a client maybe watching this. You get what you pay for. If you pay peanuts, you get monkeys. Yeah. Okay? It's just as simple as that. If you want the best car, you're going to pay a lot of money. Yeah. And like you said there, I would say don't be afraid to pay somebody. Even if it's for short term. Because we're here to help at the end of the day. Yeah, or the same for... Uh, there's lots of videos where I've done where I've recommended books and stuff like that. So what you could do, you could comment below, oh, Scott, what's, uh, I want to learn more about speed. Right, I've got a book on speed. Yeah. Oh, Scott, I want to learn more about deadlifting. I've got a book on deadlifting, or Michael's got a book on deadlifting. So it isn't a case of that you need to always pay us but it's important for you to understand that if you want to work with us one-to-one, -one, then it's a paid system, okay? I so I hope you've enjoyed the talk. Have you got one more thing to say, Michael? I've got one more thing to say. Thank you very much, Scott. And you too, buddy. Man handshake. Buddy. <laughs> See a lot you. bigger hands than him. <laughs> <laughs> but so I uh, hope you've enjoyed the video and we'll be much. uploading videos on a regular basis. And if you go to... Michael's Instagram uh, page is called Coach Living Legend. The Coach Living Legend. <laughs> and the reason why he's a Coach Living Legend, now I had an argument <laughs> with him about this at the beginning. <laughs> but true. when you see what this guy can lift, yep. you will understand why he's the Living Legend. And, not, and, and because he's only, <laughs> is it 75 kilo you weigh? 76. So he's 76 Six kilo. Nine. And what's your one rep max? At the moment, it was 240. 240 kilos. How many of you guys out there are doing that? 
Okay, so thanks very much. Lovely Thank chatting you. to you. Have a, have a great day. Please subscribe. Otherwise, my 18... Oh, you can't see them. There you go. Nah, oh, you're Watch not out, Michael. Michael. <laughs> you, you get my 18-inch guns around your neck. So yeah. I'll speak to you soon again. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Please subscribe and please share, share the video. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.